breaking news, angry words being thrown around again in the wake of yet another tragedy on American soil. In this nation reaching unbelievable levels of Distrust of our government, of our institutions, it just seems to be political divide intensifying. It seems like everyone has an opinion on these debates. More and more wrapped into their political leaders. All right, let's go. Man, <laughs> I've been gone so long I forgot when the sermon started. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, so glad to be home. Uh, Sarah and I just led a group of 60 uh, Compassion Christians on a life-changing pilgrimage to Israel, and I will never forget it. Uh, I just want to give you a little flyover of some of the stuff that uh, we did while we were over there. Uh, man, we spent some time uh, on the Sea of Galilee, uh, teaching on the Sea of Galilee. Big windstorm came up. We arranged all that just so it would be just like the Bible. Uh, we spent some time uh, in the desert where Jesus went through the temptations. We had a little bit better time than he did, uh, but we went to that spot, which is awesome. Uh, we baptized 45 people in the Jordan River while we were over there, which is amazing. Uh, man, I'm telling you, John the Baptist baptized the Lord Jesus pretty much in that same spot, which was amazing. Then, man, we back on the bus, off to Jerusalem we go. We show up at this uh, cliff looking over the holy city, which was kind of kind of an awesome thing. Then we prayed in the Mount of Olives. These olive trees were there when Jesus was there, sweating drops of blood. We think on this rock, and the church had been built around it. Back up, back up, back up. Uh, we think on this rock where, you know, uh, a church had been built around that now. Uh, we went to the Wailing Wall uh, in Jerusalem and prayed for the peace of Jerusalem and the Middle East. We worshiped in the shepherd fields. You know, you can see across here, these are, they are all dry now because it's like California. It's summertime, it's really dry. But man, these are the fields where literally uh, David kept his daddy's sheep back in the day and, and where the shepherds were when the angels uh, alerted them that Jesus had been born. <clears throat> we went to the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem, which is the most visited tomb in the world because of who is not in it. Can I get Amen. And we actually worshiped in the theater, the ancient theater in the city of Caesarea Martima, which is the city where Paul launched the last two of his three missionary journeys and literally uh, may have testified in this theater in handcuffs from which he was shipped out to Rome when he finally made it to the city that the book of uh, Romans was written to. Now, if you're brand new here at our church, Three weeks ago, we started a study in the book of Romans, and I just want to encourage you to get you a Bible. If you don't have one, I'll get you one. Come see me afterwards, I'll give you one. Bring that Bible with you, and we're just going to work chapter by chapter by chapter through the book of Romans. This is the book that Paul wrote to the church in Rome that he had never actually had an opportunity to visit. And if you're brand new, let me just catch you up quickly on the first three chapters of this book. Paul starts out in chapter one by saying, hey, I'm Paul, love you guys. Uh, want to help you find a life-changing faith in Jesus because a life-changing faith will change everything. Now, friends, this is super important because the church in Rome is full of Jewish people and non-Jewish people. And the Jewish people come from a very moral, very religious uh, background. The Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, come from a very immoral, irreligious background. And the Jewish Christians have put their faith in Jesus, but they grew up thinking that you had to keep the Old Testament law. You gotta keep all the rules, it's super important. So maybe they're thinking it's faith in Jesus plus getting all the rules just right. The Gentiles, <laughs> they put their faith in Jesus too, but they're a little confused about how this rule keeping thing works because they didn't know any of the law until they got into the church and they realized they had broken just about all of them and had a good time doing it. So Paul understands this confusion and he writes to both of these groups to say, no, relax y'all, salvation comes from a life-changing faith and Paul assures them that nobody has ever been saved by keeping the law, period. Now, in chapters one, two, and three, he starts this letter with kind of a good news, bad news format. Here's the bad news. Gentiles, if y'all didn't grow up in church, you grew up ignorant of the Old Testament law, you, you grew up ignorant of God's expectations, too late for you to be saved by the law, forget about it. You've already broken too many of them, that's the bad news. Got worse news for the Jewish folk, you grew up knowing the Old Testament law, You've known exactly what God wanted all your life, what his expectations were, but you didn't keep the law either, so you can't be saved by the law either. 
Now, about this time, they're all thinking, thank you for this encouraging letter. This is awesome, right? So what Paul is basically saying in chapters 1, 2, and 3 is whether you come from a religious background or an irreligious background, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Say it with me, everybody. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if salvation is about getting it all right all the time, nobody has done that. Consequently, everybody is lost spiritually apart from Jesus because we have all fallen short. Can I get amen? amen. Now, just in case you think, oh, you might be different, <laughs> or you're above average, or you know what, you, you, you're doing some good stuff. You're making this merit system work, man. Let's do a little experiment uh, that we've done before. I'm going to read you the Ten Commandments, and I want you to keep track, just on your program, how many of you have never broken, all right? Think of this as a pop test. We'll grade the papers. We'll ch change papers and grade them at the end. And if you still think you're above average by the end of this test, here's the crazy bad news. The Bible teaches you only have to break one to fall short. Just one. It's kind of like if you're hanging off a cliff by a chain with 10 links. How many links has got to break before you fall and die? Just one, right? So here we go. First commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. If you have always put God first, you've never put money, sex, pleasure, ego, or family ahead of the Lord. Count that as one you've never broken. The second commandment is, you shall not make for yourself any graven image. If you've never made an idol, you've never bowed down and worship it, count that as one you've never broken. Aren't you glad that one's in there, y'all? <laughs> I'm on the scoreboard, maybe, right? Uh, number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. If you have never used the name of God or Jesus in profanity, if you have never flippantly said, oh my God, or if you've never texted OMG on a text message, Count that as one you've never broken. <laughs> Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If you've always observed worship in a way that honors God, if you've never skipped church to sleep in or go to a ball game or skipped church on vacation, if you've never done disrespectful to worship by showing up late or leaving early, <laughs> God's watching and so am I, I'm just telling y'all. If you've always made the Lord's day a day of rest, count that as one, all right? The fifth command says, honor your father and your mother. If you've always obeyed your parents when you were little, if you've never talked back, if you never made fun of your daddy's pants, uh, if, you, <laughs> if you've taken care of your parents when they were older without complaining, count that as one you've never broken. Number six, you shall not kill. If you've never murdered anybody, count that. Now, of course, the New Testament, Jesus says, if you hate somebody, anybody in your heart, then you're guilty of murder in God's eyes, but we won't interpret it that way. If you've never actually murdered anybody, count that as one you've never broken. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. If you have never been unfaithful to your mate, if you've never had sex outside of marriage, count that as one you haven't broken. Of course, now Jesus said in the New Testament that if you lust in your heart, you're guilty of sexual impurity, but we won't count it that way. If you've been sexually impure inside, if you've never been sexually impure inside or outside of marriage, count that one. Number eight, you shall not steal. If you've never taken a nickel out of your mama's purse, never stolen a grape out of the produce department, or an answer off somebody else's test, or a half hour from your employer, count that one as a, as a good one, all right? Number nine, you shall not lie. If you've never been dishonest, you've never told your parents you were going somewhere and then you went somewhere else, you've never shorted the IRS, never told somebody their baby was cute when it looked like Winston Churchill, <laughs> count that as one you've never broken, all right? Now, if you, the last commandment is you shall not covet. If you've never craved something or someone that belonged to somebody else, wife, husband, friend, house, hairline, waistline, or bottom line, count that as one you've never broken. Now, let me see the hands of everybody who's kept all 10. Come on, don't be ashamed of it. Humility is not one, all right? Nobody? All right, now listen, we have just proven that Paul is right. There is no one righteous not even one. Not even one. All right, how many of y'all kept nine? Eight? Seven? Dude, this is a sinful crowd, y'all. <laughs> this is a sinful crowd. Now, I think I might have kept three, maybe. <laughs> I've never made an idol. I've never killed anybody. And the third one is none of your business. But I, I'm telling you, <laughs> that's a 30. I made a 30 on the test. Now, friends, apparently we got the same problem that the folks in Rome have. We haven't sinned a little bit. Dude, we've sinned a lot. And that's why Paul says again, and Jason taught us this last week, 
Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. It's all about having a life-changing faith in Jesus. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Man, Bob Russell says when we compare our life to the straight edge of the law, dude, that's when we realize, you know, how sinful we are. Now, that's the bad news. Here's the good news. In Romans 3.21, Paul says, but now a righteousness, a right standing with God, apart from the law, keeping the rules all right all the time, has been made known to us. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to everyone who believes. Thank God there is a way to get right with God without having to get everything right all the time, which none of us can do. Paul says putting your trust in God's grace through faith in Jesus is not only enough to save you and secure your eternal life, it is the only way to be saved and the only way to have eternal life when you die. And friends, to try to help his hearers understand this, in chapter 4, turn to Romans chapter 4, Paul is going to share with them an illustration. Now, he could not have chosen any illustration that more people in his day would understand. He is going to remind them of the most famous man of faith in the religious world. He's going to show them how life-changing faith is seen in the life of Abraham. Now, Abraham was like the George Washington of the Jewish people. I mean, he, and not just the Jewish people, most of the religious people on earth. Listen, Abraham was the first Jewish man. Consequently, everybody, all of the Jewish people trace their faith back to Abraham through his promised son, Isaac. The Muslims also trace their faith all the way back to Abraham through another son that Abraham had named Ishmael, which he had with his wife's handmaid. Christians trace their faith all the way back to Abraham because Jesus is a descendant of Isaac. So literally, most of the religious people in the world trace their faith back to Abraham. So Paul could not have thought of a better illustration for the life-changing difference true faith can make. So look at chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? Now, what matter? Well, whether you can earn your salvation by just being better than other folks, being good enough, or is it totally about humbly accepting the grace of God through faith in Jesus? Verse 2, if, an if, big if there, if, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Because God knows everything. God knows every sinful act, every sinful thought, every sinful intent. What does the scripture say then? Abraham believed God. He believed, everybody say believed. believed. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, you can look that up for yourself in Genesis chapter 15 if you want to. Paul is introducing two huge terms in this verse the word justified, and the word credited. Now, justified means if you have a life-changing faith, then God no longer holds your sins against you because your sins have been paid for by Jesus. Now, friends, just think about the sin in your past that you are most ashamed of. And everybody here has one of those. The sin you are most ashamed of when you put your faith in Jesus, God justifies you and forgives that sin and remembers it no more. Now, have you ever heard the phrase, no free lunch? People say that, there ain't no free lunch, man. And I might want to push back on that a little bit because I've had a lot of free lunches because a lot of y'all have paid for my lunch, all right? Now, it wasn't really free, it's just free to me because somebody had to pick up that tab. Now, that's how your most humiliating sin was forgiven. God didn't just write that off. He justifies you because somebody else paid the bill for it. And that's about the second big word in this verse, credited. You were justified because your, credit, your sins were credited to Jesus. Credited is an accounting term. It means the debt for your sin was paid when that debt was transferred over to Jesus. And listen, we celebrate this every Easter. Man, we celebrate the atoning death of Jesus on the cross where he paid for all of our sin. Every week, Man, we remember Jesus and we honor his sacrifice for us when we take the Lord's Supper and we remember his body. The bread represents his body on the cross. The, the juice represents his blood that was shed for us. Man, when we put our faith in Jesus, God justifies us by crediting our sin to Jesus on the cross. And according to verse 2, 3,000 years earlier, Abraham was saved exactly the same way. Not, not by good works, not by getting it all right all the time, 
but by faith. Now, just in case any of his readers are saying, I don't know about that, he cites another Jewish hero to show that life-changing faith produced, you know, provided security for David. Now, if Abraham was the George Washington of the Jewish people, David was like the Abe Lincoln. I mean, he was the most respected, admired king in Israel's history. But look what Paul writes about him in verse six. David says the same thing, man, when he speaks about the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Your faith in God is why he credits you with righteousness, not because you're getting it all right all the time. David says, blessed are those whose transgressions have been forgiven, whose sin has been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Now, friends, David was an amazing man. In fact, I took 60 compassion Christians to the very spot where he won his great battle against Goliath. We got that picture? Can we put that one up? This is the Valley of Elah. We've got another picture there, I think. No, we don't. This is, there it is right there. Man, don't put that up. People will be lusting after my legs. Put that picture down, man. That's a sin right there. It's got to be credited to somebody, all right? But anyway, that's the Valley of Elah where David took care of Goliath, right? David was a man who was respected, loved, hero, risked his life uh, for, for his kingdom, but he was also a man who struggled with temptation and lost a lot. David committed adultery with his friend's wife and then lied about it and then killed that friend over it and then watched his family disintegrate because of that sin. It's a cautionary tale, man. It's a tragic story. But in Psalm 32, when David finally humbles himself and he comes clean and confesses that sin to God, he receives forgiveness and he believes he is forgiven not because he deserves it, but he believes it's because God justifies him because of his faith. Consequently, he felt the peace and joy that comes to dirty, rotten sinners like me who finally repent and find themselves justified and credited with a righteousness they did not earn. It was, theologians say, imputed to them because of their faith in God, which leads us to another big idea that Paul's trying to illustrate. Man, life-changing faith supersedes performance and ritual. Man, now, you know, we've been, he's been talking about these two great men, but everybody in the crowd, they know Abraham. They know David. They know they are also flawed men. Abraham had a lifelong problem with lying. Can you believe that? Every time he got pushed in a corner, he started getting fast and loose with the truth. I mean, you know, his wife was beautiful, I mean, drop dead beautiful, and they're going somewhere, and man, the king of that uh, countryside says, hey, is that your wife, Sarah? And he's like, no, she ain't my wife. That's my sister. Because he thought they'd kill him so that the king could have Sarah, and, and man, it just turned into a big old mess. Every time Abraham got under pressure, he lied. Every time he got, felt afraid, he lied. Now, none of us would do that, right? I mean, none of us get pushed in the corner and we start deny, deny, deny because we've been caught about something at home or at work. We, we never do that. And none of us lie to ourselves, right? I mean, like when David blows his family up over that adultery with that woman, uh, none of us would ever say, well, the kids will be all right with this divorce. They understand, I just needed to have that affair for me. You ever heard anybody rationalize sin like that? Of course. And that's exactly what it is. Rationalizing is a rational lie. It's a lie you tell yourself. Now, Paul is using the life of Abraham and David to show that obviously performance is not how people get saved. And thank God, because none of us get it all right all the time. But friends, the good news is that we can put our faith in Jesus just like Abraham did, just like David did, just like Paul did, and we can be justified by grace through faith in Jesus and not because we always get it right all the time. Friends, when you're saved by faith, you don't lose the love of God either when you mess up. It's grace. So you've got nothing to brag about. You've got nothing to be proud about. It comes to you as a gift. Now, Paul is mentioning flawed Abraham and flawed David to illustrate the unconditional love of God. If your faith is in God, nothing you can do will make him love you more. He already loves you more than you can imagine. And nothing you can do will ever make him love you less. Is there anybody in your world that loves you like that? Isn't it great to know the most perfect, powerful person in the universe loves you like that? Now, I don't want to belabor this argument, but Paul does. <laughs> he goes on to say, religious rituals don't save you either. I mean, so many religions teach that, that you can actually unconsciously go through some motion. 
You can go through some ritual. Your parents can do it to you. Or you can participate in some fast or have some kind of special communion. And when you do that deed, doesn't matter whether you believe or not, doesn't matter whether you have faith or not, somehow just magically you get saved. And Paul is saying, folks, not true. He uses circumcision, which was a physical identifier of every Jewish male, started with Abraham to make this point. Look at verse 9. He says, is the blessedness, this forgiveness, this justification that comes by faith in God, is this only for the circumcised, the people who've been through this religious ritual? Or is it also for the uncircumcised? Now remember who Paul's writing to. He's writing to the church in Rome that is full of both Jewish and Gentile Christ followers. All the Jewish males were circumcised as kids to mark them as part of the people of God. But the church is also full of other Christ followers who did not grow up Jewish. They have not been circumcised. And so the question is, how important is it? We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness in verse 9. Under what circumstances then was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? Now, if you read Abraham's story back in Genesis 15, it says he was 85 years old when Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. And then two chapters later, in Genesis 17, Abraham is 99 years old when it says, on that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all of those born in his household and circumcised them as God told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised. That brother had to love the Lord. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Now, notice that Abraham's faith was credited to him 14 years before he was circumcised and became literally the first Jewish man. Now, friends, my religion, any religious ritual you go through, this is what you should learn from this. Any religious ritual you go through that is not based on your faith is meaningless. It is meaningless to God and it is spiritually meaningless to you. That's why we don't baptize infants in our church. There's no example of that in the Bible anywhere because a baby cannot put their faith in Jesus. Now that's a ritual that parents go through and they kind of make a commitment to raise their child for Jesus and that's awesome, but the kid doesn't have a clue what's going on. This is also why every now and then when we get ready to take the Lord's Supper, we'll just tell people, if you're not a follower of Jesus, don't feel any pressure to participate. Don't, don't go through any meaningless ritual here. Nobody will judge you. You don't need to take the Lord's Supper because it won't mean anything to you. You haven't been justified yet. Your sins have not been credited to Jesus because you have not put your faith in him yet. When you do, communion will become very meaningful for you. Friends, I'll tell you here at Compassion, we don't encourage anybody to go through any meaningless religious motions at our church because apart from faith it don't mean a thing the writer of hebrews said without faith man it is impossible to please god doesn't matter what you do no how much money you give no matter how much effort you make how nice you are it, if it's not based on faith it is not going to impress the lord now the reason paul is making such a big deal out of this is because life-changing faith <clears throat> man it has a supernatural impact now, this is the point where Paul is reminding his readers that faith not only saved Abraham, but wow, it had a supernatural effect on his life. Look at verse 13. Now, as you see how we're going through this verse by verse by verse by verse, this will be a really great series of messages to bring a Bible for. Amen? And that way, even if you don't, have a, even if you don't know how to find Romans, just flip to it and make it, you look more spiritual. It'll be awesome. All right? Look at verse 13. Ah, that's a meaningless religious motion. Don't do that. Bring your Bible and read it. Here we go. Verse 13, it was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, that he's going to put Jewish people all over the world. It wasn't by the law that that happened, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For those who live by law are, excuse me, for if those who live by law are heirs, then faith has no value and the promise is worthless because the law just brings wrath. This is what we learned last week in Romans chapter 3. The wages of sin is the wrath of God. The wages of sin is death. Everybody who ever tried to please God by doing good works failed. And that failure to keep the law leads to the wrath of God. And where there is no law, you know, the Gentile folks who don't even know what you talk about, well, they don't even know 
They're transgressing God's law. He's saying, man, if you don't know the law, you're totally ignorant of how far out in the weeds you actually are. Verse 16, therefore, the promise comes to Abraham by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are just of faith, the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all, Jews, Gentiles, Paul is telling the Romans and us, bro, if you grew up with the Bible, if you didn't grow up with the Bible, if you put your faith in the God of Abraham, you will be saved by the God of Abraham. Just as it is written in verse 17, and y'all watch this. I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. Now, now look at this next phrase because this is the kind of God Abraham believed in and this is the kind of God who loves you. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as if they were. Now, friend, the reason you know who this 5,000-year-old Abraham is today is because he had a relationship based on faith with a supernaturally powerful God who can come into any situation and bring dead to life. He can speak things into existence that don't exist, and he did it in Abraham's life. And here's the crazy thing. If your faith is in Abraham's God, you are trusting the one God that you know for sure can give life to the dead because the resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact. And you link up with that God, and he can call things that are not as if they were in your life too. And I got reminded of that on Monday. On Monday, I just got back from Israel. I went into this store at Savannah Mall. One of the employees said, hey, Pastor Cam. And I thought, I better behave. She knows who I am, right? So anyway, <laughs> I was just thrilled. I was thrilled to see a compassionate Christian, you know, with that great, joyful attitude. I mean, she's got to be a huge asset to that business, Right. And so while she's helping me, I ask her, how long have you been coming to Compassion? She said, about a year. And then we visit a little bit, and then she said, Pastor Cam, come to Compassion, save my marriage. And I was like, really? She said, it did. She, she was just so excited about the change that Jesus is making in her marriage. She's bragging to me about the spiritual leadership that her husband is showing for the very first time in his life. She said, he's reading the Bible and praying every day. He's never done anything like that before. It was since he came to Compassion, and he put his faith in Jesus. Now, usually when somebody tells me a story like that, I'll, I'll go, and this is sarcastic, I shouldn't do this, but I'll go, do I look surprised? And they'll say, no. And I'll say, I'm not. I'm not surprised. I have seen God bring dead marriages back to life a hundred times. When you are walking in faith with a God who can bring the dead back to life, he brings dead marriages in our church back to life all the time. I don't know if you remember this. I hope you don't. <laughs> at the last baby dedication service, I was here at Henderson, and I came in late for the baby dedication service, which is like a big sin, right? Sarah started without me. You see her up there? You see the pastor of this church up there anywhere? No. She started without me, and actually, it was a little bit better before I got there than it was after I got there. You know why I wasn't on the stage? Because I was out here in a concourse praying for a couple who have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for years for a baby and after many difficulties and many delays and many disappointments, man, they're holding this beautiful little baby in their arms and they brought him here for worship for the very first time. And man, we're out in the lobby just marveling with them at how the God we trust in whom we put our faith has calling some, called something that was not into existence, a baby in their home. Now, to end this chapter, Paul reminds us of how God brought the dead to life in Abraham's life and then called into existence something that did not exist. And he just wants to show us one more time that, man, a life-changing faith is sequential. Everybody say sequential. sequential. What would y'all say? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's sequential as it moves toward maturity. It goes through stages. When you put your faith in God, it grows through stages. Now, Paul summarizes in these last few verses what it takes 10 chapters to say in Genesis 12 through 22. He says in verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so he became the father of many nations, just as had been said of him, so shall your offspring be. Now, this is a weird way to start his testimony. Against all hope, in hope, infertile Abraham, who was 75 years old, and never had a child, 
became the father of a great nation. You know what that means? Abraham was saying, apart from God, dude, I'm in a hopeless situation. But I have put my faith in a God who specializes in hopeless situations. Let me give you the backstory here. When Abraham was 75 years old, God reached out to him. He was living right here in Ur of the Chaldees in what we call Iraq today, all right? And he called Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees and go to Canaan, which is what we call Israel today, up through Haran. It was a long, long trip, but God told him that if you will do what I tell you to do, Abraham, I will make you the father of a great nation. Now he's 75 years old, wife was totally infertile, never been able to have any children at all, but Abraham believed in God, and not just believed in God, he believed what God said. And so he left his home in like the Las Vegas of the ancient world and traveled, 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 travel all the way to, to Israel to become a settler there. So in faith, he leaves his home and goes to Israel to settle. Eleven years go by. And at 86, God appears to him again and makes him another promise. He says, Abraham, I'm not only going to make you the father of a great nation. Walk outside your tent and look up, bro. And so he walks outside the tent and he looks up and he says, you see all the stars up there? I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand in the sea. Now, at this point, Abraham feels compelled to remind God that he's getting older. He's like, Lord, I'm 86 years old. My wife is 76. Now, we believe you, but we've been infertile our whole marriage and my wife is getting old. Now, he didn't say that because he wasn't crazy. But anyway, you know, we're both getting older. Now, remarkably, they had that conversation and he didn't hear from God again for 13 years. And when he is 99 years old, still has no children, look at verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Listen to that phrase. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. I love this guy. Abraham courageously faces the facts. He's not one of these sappy, let's live in the Nile guys. He faces the facts. I am 99 years old. My reproductive powers are dead. My Sarah is 89 years old. She's been barren all her life. We've never been able to have kids. Abraham is not the kind of guy who sticks his head in the sand. He knows that if God's going to keep this promise, it's going to take a miracle. Fortunately, he has put his faith in a miracle working God. So at 99, God comes to him again. Abraham. Yes, sir. What'd you learn about me in children's church? Uh, Lord, I learn that you are the kind of God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as if they are. So you worried about this baby Abraham? Yes, sir, a little bit. What's the problem, bro? What's the problem? If you believe I can raise the dead, if you believe I can speak non-existent things into existence, why do you have any problem believing that I can empower a 99-year-old man to make an 89-year-old woman pregnant? Well, Lord, now that you mention it, i got no problem at all. I must confess, though, I'm a little impatient. Uh, I've been waiting on this for 24 years. And God said, Abraham, you are impatient. You need to work on that. <laughs> yes, sir, I think you're right about that. Now, you read on through this story. And you ought to read this story tonight because it's funny, man. God told Abraham at the end of that conversation, a year from today, you're going to be holding your baby. And he went home and told Sarah, girlfriend, tonight is the night. <laughs> and you know what she did? <laughs> She laughed. She laughed. He said, baby, you're getting pregnant tonight. And, you know, she laughed. Now, that's because she didn't believe Abraham. If she'd have believed him, she'd have cried. Amen? <laughs> if she'd have been crying, 99-year-old woman pregnant, I think I'd been crying too. But, friends, one year later, Sarah is going to the grocery store to buy Pampers and Depends at the same time. <laughs> it's the truth. Little Isaac bouncing on that 100-year-old knee of Abraham. Everybody in the country celebrating the arrival. They didn't know it then, but of the progenitor of the Lord Jesus himself who had miraculously arrived on this planet because of his daddy's faith. Now look at how God remembers Abraham. Look at verse 20. Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Well, maybe a little bit. Because I mean, he did wiggle a little bit, right? But, but really, he never let go of his faith. He struggled. He went through depression. He got sad. He got impatient. But he never gave up on that hope. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but he was strengthened in his faith. He gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised to do. And this is why it was credited to him. His faith was credited to him as righteousness. Friends, we believe in that same God who has that same power. And if we trust him, 
he'll show up for us too. But when he does, it'll probably follow the same pattern that we see in the life of Abraham and Sarah. And when you see God show up, it'll go through the five stages you know, of life-changing faith. First of all, you will grasp a kingdom dream. Everybody say dream. Abraham had a dream that would require him to leave everything, leave his family, leave his wealth, travel across the desert, stretch his faith, walk by faith for the rest of his life, live in a land. He didn't even know where he was going when he left Ur of the Chaldees. But God had called him to do it, and he was going to do it. Now, if you have a dream like that, I believe you can count on God to show up. Lord, I want to have a great marriage. My problem is I grew up in this super dysfunctional family. I don't have a clue what I'm doing here. But Lord, can you help me have a great marriage? Yes. Lord, I want to have, be a self-controlled man. I want to control my temper. Yes, I want to be, have awesome communication skills. We can do that. Courageous in witnessing, inspiring parent, life-changing mentor. I want to live a healthy lifestyle. God, I want to have a godly influence. Dude, that is a kingdom dream. You want me to pray with you about that? I'll be glad to pray with you about that. You want me to pray that you get a new toy? Forget about it. But you got a kingdom dream. Bro, I will pray with you. And I believe God will notice that. Next stage, you make a decision. Everybody say decision. Decision. Abraham basically said, Lord, the answer is yes. What's the question? You want me to leave Ur, where everybody's at, happening place, go to Canaan, never heard of that before? Yes. Lord, you want me to honor my spouse? Yes. Lord, you want me to prioritize my family? Yes. You want me to love people I was taught to look down on? Yes. You want me to be a part of your church? Yes. You want me to serve you in some specific way? Yes. Friends, you will never see God show up until you start saying yes to the God who gave you that kingdom dream in the first place. Third stage, you will face delays. Everybody say delay. Delay. Everybody heard that promise, Abraham heard that promise from God when he was 75 years old, which should be encouraging to all the baby boomers here who are retiring from your career and you are healthier and stronger and more ready for a significant second half than ever before. But it was 24 years later and Abraham's dream had not become a reality yet. Dude, delay is what demonstrates if you have the kind of faith that won't quit, won't surrender, won't be overrun by doubt, won't be dampened by discouragement, won't knuckle under to despair. Facing delay is part of having a life-changing faith. Amen? You will endure difficulties. Everybody say difficulties. Abraham hung tough until his wife Sarah found it so difficult to wait that she came up with an alternate plan And rather than help lead her spiritually, he just went along with it. She said, Abraham, why don't you sleep with my handmaid and see if she'll get pregnant? And maybe we can have a child that way. Now, guys, y'all look at me. Men, look at me. If your wife ever says, it's okay with me if you sleep with that younger woman over there, she is hallucinating. Or you're hallucinating. That was a horrible decision. They got tired of waiting on God, so they just came up with a plan B. That decision happened while they were facing the kind of difficulties that we all face while we are waiting, waiting, waiting on God, trusting, trusting God. They made a dumb decision that is still plaguing our world 5,000 years later. In Genesis 17, Abraham sleeps with Hagar. She gets pregnant. They have a baby named Ishmael. All the Arab people and the Muslims trace trace their ancestry back to that baby. And listen, God took care of Hagar and Ishmael because because it wasn't the baby's fault that Abraham and Hagar sinned. But just a little bit later, I mean, just months later, when Sarah gets pregnant at 89 and has Isaac, the child of promise, imagine the regret she felt because she didn't hold fast in hope and wait for God to answer their prayers. Friends, God will never lead you to do a bad thing in order to do a good thing. Amen? Never happened. But friends, if like Abraham, your faith does not waver, which is not to say you won't make mistakes because God knows Abraham and Sarah did. But if your faith does not waver, the last stage of faith comes when you experience deliverance. Man, your prayer is answered. The baby arrived. The people of Israel began to form into a nation as numerous as the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. You know, last week, we had a great privilege here uh, at Compassion. Uh, A police officer in Savannah, uh, Anthony Christie, uh, was killed in the line of duty. And we were asked if we would minister to those folk and host that funeral. They were expecting thousands of people to show up. And as you know, I was in Israel. And so that request came in, and our team, our team here at the church, we host a worship service every three days. 
I mean, you're in one, every three days, we roll out a worship service. And so jamming, you know, something like that into our schedule is not easy, but it was an opportunity to love our city and fulfill our calling. And so, man, our team just jumped on it. I mean, all the, yes, we can do this. Then we started calling volunteers. Will you help? Will you serve? Can you get here? Will you rearrange your schedule? Will you just make it happen? Make a sacrifice to make it happen. Yes, 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 yes. And, And then the police department and the folks at the funeral home and the mayor and the family and everybody else in our community that came to that service were just amazed at the love our church showed to our community in such a sad, sad moment. Why? Why did everybody rearrange their schedule? Why did volunteers just drop what they were doing and come to church to serve? Why? Because we believe in the great supernatural God who saved Abraham by faith and that God saved us. And the same God that called Abraham called us And man, the same God that worked through Abraham works today through us, just like he did back then. And you will never see that kind of thing happen unless you dream a kingdom dream and you make a decision and you endure through those delays and difficulties until God delivers your reward. And friends, let's just pray our faith in God will make a life-changing difference in us and then through us like it did for Abraham. Father, thank you for this time you've given us to be together. And thank you for Abraham. Thank you, Father, for his example. Thank you for his resilience. Thank you, Father, for the depth of his faith. And really, Lord, his faith wasn't so strong. It was who he put his faith in. And he put his faith in you. And I'm thankful he did because he helped teach us to do the same thing. Pray, God, that many will. In Jesus' name, amen.